Good morning. My name is Deborah Widas. I'm the Associate Dean for Research at IU Mauer Law, and you'll be hearing from our Dean Austin Parrish at lunch, but I just wanted to welcome you all to the Indiana Law Journal Symposium on Compelled Speech. I wish I were welcoming you here to Bloomington, um, to our campus in person, but I will say that a silver lining of this happening on Zoom is that we have already a large uh, group of attendees as well as the conference participants here um, and able to participate in what I know is going to be a fabulous lineup of speakers exploring this crucially important issue of free speech doctrine, which doesn't get as much attention as other aspects of the free speech doctrine. Um, I'm also particularly pleased that Robert Post of Yale Law School will be giving the Addison C. Harris lecture as a keynote speech at lunch this is one of our regular endowed lecture series at the law school, and we were so pleased to be able to work with the organizers of the symposium to sort of combine one of our major endowed lectures with the larger symposium. Um, and again, uh, because it is on Zoom, we have been uh, promoting that not just to the local Maurer community and Bloomington community, to, but to our alums and our friends throughout uh, the country. And so I, um, I'm so pleased uh, that the, we'll have that broader reach for the lecture and for your whole day. Um, I just, before I turn it over to um, the people who really have done much more to put this together, I want to thank them. So my thanks to Alex Tessis and Carolyn Corbin um, for organizing the symposium, putting together a great lineup of speakers. To Caitlin Levesque and Reese Sobel and the rest of the Indiana Law Journal editors for the work that they have done to put this together and the work they will do uh, to um, work with you to take your papers and finalize them for publication in the Indiana Law Journal. Thanks to my colleague Steve Sanders, who as faculty supervisor for the Indiana Law Journal and a key member of our Con Law faculty has done a lot to facilitate those connections. To my colleagues, Susan Williams, Dan Conkle, and Ken Dow Schmidt, who will be moderating panels. Thanks to Chelsea Browning, our amazing events coordinator, who has um, done a great job transitioning from organizing in-person events to virtual events. Um, and to Marion Conaty and the rest of our tech team, um, who have done a lot to put this together um, as a hopefully very smooth running conference, um, but I know that they will also be able to quickly fix any tech issues should they arise. And really just thanks to all the panelists and the attendees for coming together for what I think will be a really fascinating day. Um, and with that, I will turn it over. There we go. Good morning, everyone. My name is Caitlin klingler Levesque, and I am the editor-in-chief of Volume 96 of the Indiana Law Journal. Welcome to the journal symposium, Compelled Speech, the Cutting Edge of First Amendment Jurisprudence. The symposium was organized by professors Caroline Malacorbin of the University of Miami and Alexander Tessis of Loyola University, Chicago. The Indiana Law Journal is immensely grateful that the organizers entrusted us with the task of helping to bring their ideas to fruition. When Alex and Caroline presented us with their symposium proposal about a year ago, we knew that we had an opportunity to share something invaluable. The perspectives of responsible and respected scholars in the ever evolving and consequential arena of compelled speech. It has been an honor to work with these distinguished scholars and it's an honor to host all of you today. Today you will hear from 10 scholars, all experts in the arena of compelled speech. They come to us from California, Connecticut and everywhere in between. They will pose and address critical questions about compelled speech in the context of the workplace, religious freedom, the internet and parental rights. They question the boundaries and contours of the doctrine in its current state and they anticipate where we are heading. They offer descriptive and prescriptive, oh, sorry about my puppy, <laughs> prescriptive and descriptive analyses of the, of the doctrine in ways that we know will have implications across this important field. We look forward to hearing their perspectives as the day unfolds and we know that you do as well. 
In a better world, we would be spending this day together in person, but we believe that this platform offers us the closest possible approximation of an in-person event. We're grateful to all of you for being so adaptable and to our tech team for making all of, for all of their amazing hard work in, in making this event possible. The talks that you hear today will be published in volume 97 of the Indiana Law Journal next year. Before I turn it over to Professor Corbin, I want to go over a couple of logistical housekeeping notes. First, we would appreciate if all participants would keep their microphones muted when they are not speaking. And we also ask that the panelists keep their cameras on throughout the day when possible, so that those speaking could be speaking to a visible audience and not into the, the Zoom void with which we've all become unfortunately familiar. Finally, either I or my colleague Reese Sobel will be directing everyone to breaks and welcoming everyone back throughout the day. You can stay logged into Zoom all day if you want or log off during breaks and then return when the symposium resumes. Finally, the journal has many people to thank for making this event possible and my colleague Reese will offer his gratitude on behalf of the journal later today. For now, however, I would like to thank Reese himself. Reese is our executive articles editor for volume 96 of the journal, meaning that his primary role was choosing articles for publication in this year's volume, which also means that his job could have been over for the most part around May of last year. But instead, when I asked him for his help putting together the symposium, he accepted enthusiastically and graciously. He has put in countless hours into the creation of this event, asking nothing in return but the satisfaction of a job well done. And it certainly has been a job well done. Reese has been a wonderful colleague this year, but he's also become a great friend and I'm very grateful for that. And with that, I will turn the metaphorical mic over to one of our wonderful organizers, Professor Caroline Mala Corbin. Thank you. Well, the very first thing I want to do is to give my thanks to the crack team at Indiana Law Journal, especially Caitlin and Reese, for putting all of this together. Thank you. Alex and I have gathered a stellar group of First Amendment scholars, and you are all in for a treat. So I'm going to briefly set the First Amendment stage for you to help situate the papers you're about to hear. So everyone understands that the free speech clause protects you from the government censoring your speech, but the free speech clause also protects you from the government forcing you to speak. The basic idea is that you control your speech. You, not the government, should decide what to say and more relevant for today, what not to say. This principle that the free speech clause includes your right to speak and the right not to speak was established in a case you will no doubt hear mentioned repeatedly, West Virginia versus Barnett, where the Supreme Court held that public schools could not require students to take the Pledge of Allegiance. While clearly government compelled speech implicates the autonomy of the speaker, the free speech clause is not only about speakers, it's also about audiences. And there are actually three main reasons why speech is considered so important that regulation of it considers a kind of, uh, triggers some kind of heightened scrutiny. So the next thing I wanna say is sort of the, there are three main theories undergirding our protection of free speech. One, as I mentioned, is promoting personal autonomy and self-expression. That one is very much focused on the speaker. But the other two are focused on the audiences. The second reason we protect speech is to encourage a marketplace of ideas, and a phrase you've no doubt encountered before. We want audiences to have the widest available pool of facts, ideas, and opinions to draw upon in our search for truth or knowledge. And three, we protect free speech because it's key to our democratic form of government. We, audiences, cannot make up our mind about policy issues or keep tabs on our politicians without a free flow of information. Thus, government speech, which actually increases the amount of speech in the world, might actually further free speech goals of a healthy stream of information. So, of course, whether government compelled speech furthers or undermines free speech goals, 
depends on the goal you're looking at, as well as a wide range of questions. So for example, is the compelled speaker even an entity that has autonomy interest? Does a for-profit company have autonomy interest, for example? Or is the government using its power to compel disclosures of factual information that might be really helpful to an audience and that are not otherwise available? Or is it using or misusing its power to force speakers to parrot its ideological message? What even counts as speech? Is donating money speech? Is baking a cake speech? Are there other constitutional rights at stake? And another question is, is the Supreme Court applying its rules in a principled way? I actually first became interested in compelled speech when I noticed that courts were treating government mandated disclosures by medical professionals to their abortion clients very differently than state mandated disclosures by crisis pregnancy centers pretending to be medical professionals. Which brings me to my sort of last stage setting part of this introduction, a few recent Supreme Court cases involving compelled speech that it would be useful to know about. So one of them is National Institute of Family and Life Advocates versus Becerra, where the Supreme Court held that it violated the free speech rights to require pro-life crisis pregnancy centers with no licensed professionals on staff to disclose to their customers that they had no licensed professionals on staff. Then there's the Janus case, Janus versus American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees held that it violated the free speech clause to require people who benefit from a union's collective bargaining to contribute, contribute union dues that supported those collective bargaining efforts. And finally, there was a case where the court didn't actually decide the free speech question, but presented the question of whether forcing bakeries to make cakes for same-sex couples violated their free speech rights. So in sum, the free speech clause protects both your right to speak and your right not to speak. And the reason we protect free speech is to promote autonomy and self-expression, to create a marketplace of ideas, and to facilitate democratic self-governance. And how these different values into play with the recent Supreme Court cases is what you'll be hearing more of from today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Corbin. It looks like it's 10 o'clock now and our first panel is uh, slotted to start at 10.15. So let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break and I will see you all back here in 15 minutes. Thank you. Welcome back everyone or welcome if you are just joining us. It is time to begin our first panel of the day entitled Compelled Speech, Rethinking the Doctrine. I will turn it over now to our moderator for this panel, Professor Susan Williams. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you to our first panel. Uh, just to give you a sense of the format here, we have three panelists, each of whom will speak for about 20 minutes each. At the end of that, we hope to have 30 minutes remaining for questions and comments and discussion. The panels each have their own individual CLE attendance codes, and the code will be posted to the chat during the question and answer period for any attendees who would like to get CLE credit. Our first speaker on the panel this morning is Professor Alexander Tessis from the Loyola University of Chicago School of Law, and his speaker is entitled Compelled Speech and Proportionality. And with that, I will turn it over to Professor Tessis. Thank you so much, uh, Susan. I'm uh, grateful for you for uh, moderating the panel and I look forward to Q&A at the end. And I, I, I'm uh, of course, want to first express my gratitude for working with uh, Caroline on this project. It's been a, 
a real pleasure working with a friend whose scholarship I so deeply respect. And on the uh, Indiana faculty, I'm uh, particularly grateful to Professor Steve Sanders, who did a, a tremendous amount of work, and Dean Austin Parrish, who personally got involved as well. And it's been a, a pleasure working with the uh, ILJ, particularly EIC, Caitlin Levesque, and Executive Articles Editor Reese Sobel. We, you know, the, it, was a, it was really a team effort, I'm deeply uh, grateful for it. So. Uh, with that, let me begin these remarks and thank you for the opportunity to give me, for giving me this forum to do so. Uh, the Supreme Court has increasingly relied on compelled speech doctrine to strike laws that require unwilling parties to inform the public of specific, specified information. The court has subjected public health, labor and consumer protection laws to heightened First Amendment scrutiny. The compelled speech doctrine has taken on a libertarian flavor that relies on exacting scrutiny or strict scrutiny to review all content-based regulations. Precedents tend to place a thumb on private speech without adequately weighing countervailing policy aims. Hence, the court has struck legislative efforts to buttress economic, privacy, and collective bargaining regulations that had an incidental effect on speech. Formalistic features of those holdings fail to distinguish speech as speech and ordinary social and economic legislation. A pattern of aggressive First Amendment jurisprudence has produced jurocentrism inconsistent with judicial modesty. The current pattern of cases sets rigid methodology that lacks nuanced reflection on the policies and contexts behind regulations that burden commercial political and medical speakers. I argue for greater analytical flexibility predicated on pr premises behind constitutionally protected free speech without taking account of all materially relevant factors and instead resorting to wooden judicially created categories, the justices too often dismiss policies concerns on matters such as consumer privacy, healthcare information and labor negotiation. Rigorous balancing is needed to determine whether regulation is narrowly tailored to serve a substantial government concern or to constitute an intrusion against the expression of political, philosophical, historical, or artistic topics. Proportional review assesses whether mandates to divulge facts have a close nexus between abstract law and concrete life. Instead of an automatic use of exacting scrutiny of all manner of compelled speech disclosures, greater breadth of social concerns should weigh into the court's review. Taking into account the context of statutory requirements to disclose certain information, the policy predicates for their enforcement and the means chosen to achieve substantial aims would help courts to better distinguish between pure speech factors and what Justice Kagan called workaday economic and regulatory policy. So I wanna now turn to the doctrine of compelled speech, if I may, and then return to theory. In early compelled speech cases, the court relied on anti-autocratic principles, treating the free speech clause as a safeguard of self-government and personal expression against imposed government orthodoxy. Early cases involved government demands on certain persons to express state-created content. The First Amendment was understood to prevent government from imposing itself upon the autonomous personal, personal and civic communications. In more recent times, the doctrine of compelled speech has become a means for courts to strike laws regulating economic and health-related re matters. The seminal case, which uh, Caroline mentioned, West Virginia v. Barnett, uh, and, and uh, as well as Woolley, were anti-authoritarian. They, they were principles on, that, that, that was the, the core principle behind what was going on, anti-authoritarianism, which was that government cannot force a person to adopt a view contrary to personal, political, informational, and otherwise protected conviction. The early cases, including Hurley versus Irish Americans, which had to do with no compelled speech in, in uh, parade, uh, 
Pacific Gas and, and Electric Company, which actually used strict scrutiny about putting information, government information in envelopes about the environment, Miami Herald about a newspaper's requirement for being, being forced to put an editorial in it at its pages, as well as Riley versus National Federation for the Blind, which also used strict scrutiny in, in limiting what the, it could be enforced against um, uh, a charity uh, and uh, solicitation work. We're all based on this anti-authoritarian principle. It was against government ideology being forced on private players. Uh, the reasoning behind more recent cases, however, was inconsistent with the dominant trend in First Amendment jurisprudence. Formalistic uses of judicially created categories inadequately weigh broader legal and social contexts of laws that require parties to display or communicate messages without their will. I now review the libertarian leanings evident in Roberts Court's First Amendment jurisprudence and demonstrate their near fatal implications for compelled speech decisions. Libertarian free speech doctrine recognizes but a few historic categories of unprotected communications. The court in Reed versus Town of Gilbert categorically sided with speech values without adequately reflecting on whether they can be balanced against quite different but nevertheless materially relevant public concerns. The core aim of the First Amendment is to protect open assertion, discourse, and debate. But the Roberts Court's reliance on compelled speech doctrine perceives speech as a monolithic category, which leads to holding public health disclosure laws in, in uh, NIFLA, a collective bargaining law in Janus, and a consumer protection statutes uh, in expressions hair design to be unconstitutional. This categorical doctrine, which subjects to heightened rev review laws with incidental effects on speech, leads to deregulation in keeping with the discarded Lochner tradition. The Roberts Court found unconstitutional that compel dis disclosure of retail charges, professional information, and collective bargaining negotiation just as readily as an earlier court in Lochner had discounted the New York law for the public safety of bakers. The court's libertarian leanings in its free speech analyses gloss over nuanced rationales behind the enforcement of compelled speech regulations. The court's reliance on an autonomy-based doctrine on protected speech glosses over con conflicts of constitutional proportion. Dean Erwin Griswold argues that balancing is a comprehensive or integral approach that accepts the task of a judge as one which involves the effect of all provisions of the Constitution, not merely in the narrow literal sense, but in the living organic sense, including the elaborate and complex governmental structure which the Constitution has erected. For instance, in the recent uh, Nifla versus Becerra case, which struck a public health law, the FACT Act, or California Reproductive Freedom and Accountability and Comprehensive Care and Transparency Act, for those who want the longer title, but FACT Act for short, meant to inform women of prenatal options. The court exhibited a lack of balance that led to a one-sided opinion, giving inadequate weight to countervailing interests, especially the state's plan to inform women of their eligibility for public counseling about services that included abortions. Those messages were imposed on pregnancy crisis centers, which were operated to dissuade women from obtaining their legal right to an abortion. The reasoning and holding in NIFLA was inconsistent with the court's earlier holding in Casey, uh, which upheld the statute co that of compelled physicians to provide pregnant women with truthful and non-misleading information about the nature of abortion procedure and attendant health risks and those of childbirth and the probable gestation age of the fetus that was allowed, even though it really imposed on the women's privacy. The lack of consistency in NIFLA with earlier precedent in Casey demonstrates that Fred Schauer has described as a realist considerations rather than precedential reasoning relied on by the court to explain doctrinal inconsistencies.
Rigid categories often compromise judicial subtlety, modesty, and objectivity. They convolute matters as disparate as abortion and even trademarks and with speech. Whether a particular judicial decision is consistent with the values of deliberative democracy should be judged by synthetic considerations of authoritative text, abstract reasoning, civic and pluralistic principles, doctrinal refre reflections, informational values, and rational applications of existing laws. Categories are useful synthetic starting points of analysis. Behind judicial categories, however, are principles of constitutional governance. Context is critical to adjudication. In his concurrence to Alvarez, Justice Breyer recommended relying on factors of proportionality. His suggestion applies to cases warranting neither near automatic condemnation as strict scrutiny applies, nor near automatic approval as is implicit in rational basis review. He argued that courts examine the seriousness and likeness, likeliness of harm, the government's counterbalancing objectives, the extent to which the state act was likely to achieve those ends, and whether other less restrictive means were able, could meet the policy objectives. Breyer's proposal test was not categorical, but nuanced, conscious of context, values, and countervailing interests. Yet it misses an important step to integrate the leaning of the European Union comparative experiences where proportionality enjoys what, what one scholar called central importance in modern public law. Moreover, it should be noted that Breyer overlooks the critically important principle of free speech law, which in compelled speech area comes to anti-authoritarian precedents as, as they were laid out in Barnett and in Woolley. This we might call the ethical mode of the First Amendment, the maintenance of individual autonomy, the development of, the, of a civic consciousness and the ability to expand knowledge. And yet the court might have deferred to California legislature on fact as public health law spreading information in the marketplace of ideas. In such matters where government provides information about women's prenatal options, courts should defer to legislators. Free speech in NIFLA was, as we, as with other healthcare decisions, subject to an undue burden test, but it would weaponize to hold and as unconstitutional, a traditional use of police power for public health, just expanding information without majority giving weight to what that countervailing concern. As the law was written to provide pregnant women with information at a time of crisis and need for accuracy, the mandated message was within the rational bounds of state health care regulation. California's FACT Act did not curtail the crisis centers from relying on alternative channels of communication. Indeed, they remained free to counsel their religious message in, in, in and out of the office. They could just tell the women their thoughts. They could just have the, the crisis intervention person just say, they, we disagree with the policy. Pregnancy crisis centers were at liberty to even conspicuously pose something opposite of the government message. Crisis centers retained their liberties of discourse and disagreement. Yet another case was rigidly prohibited state regulation was Sorrell versus IMS Helfing. The court upheld the First Amendment that the court upheld that the First Amendment protects pharmaceutical manufacturers' acquisition and curation of private records of prescriptions acquired from unwilling physicians. The state law found unconstitutional sought to protect uh, uh, privacy of healthcare records and integrity of medical profession. Data mining companies would use the prescription records to pressure physicians into prescribing more expensive medicines. That's what that law was about, preventing that than those clinically indicated or simply more affordable. The court's fixation on greater information worked to the benefit of pharmaceutical companies and struck a statute meant to disincentivize commercial vendors from profiting on the resale of medical histories 
to pharmaceutical manufacturers. The Sorrell majority labeled marketing strategy speech that warranted heightened scrutiny. The majority's fixation on first order free speech concerns gives inadequate weight to second order private and social concerns focusing on the categorical presumption that accurate marketing information is better for consumers. The court struck a law against acquiring data without the subject Data's, the data subject's consent. This raises obvious privacy concerns. Neither did IMS Health Inc. give adequate constitutional weight to at least a limited notion to the constitutional right of privacy. In di a different economic rights case with incidental effects on free speech, Expressions Hair Designs versus Schneiderman penned by Chief Justice Roberts and joined by a mixed liberal and conservative majority, demonstrates the dominant libertarian strain in American free speech doctrine. Merchants claimed their speech was affected by a New York prohibition against imposing a surcharge on credit card sales. They asserted that the law required them to label prices contrary to their commercial interests and hence intruded on their free speech. The majority found the state's credit card swipe fee law censored a protected expression rather than simply governed commercial transactions subject to intermediate scrutiny. The majority used a bright line test to, of content neutrality, discarding the claim that what was actually involved was regulation of conduct. The novel conclusion that the regulation on credit card surcharge was subject to First Amendment review because it required merchants to alter how they communicate prices seems to rest, render suspect virtually all laws on how pricing signs are displayed. Moreover, even a short list of laws restricting compelling speech uh, that receives no heightened review illustrates how misleading was the court's formalistic rule. Strict scrutiny uh, does not apply to regulations on, that require merchants to label toilets, refrigerators, air conditioners, water heaters, and other electronic consumer goods. Rx only prescription drugs, alcoholic beverages likely to cause birth defects tied to pregnant women's drinking, hazardous substances to be kept out of reach of children, marking markings on commercial vehicles, pharmaceuticals, mandatory listings of sex offenders, tobacco warnings, bank, bank titles, and federal deposit insurance corporation notifications. The difference between core free speech and commercial regulation is better identified through a balance of speech, countervailing concerns, means ends concerns, free first amendment principles against government orthodoxy, and alternative considerations. What about speech free riders? Well, in Janus versus American Federation, uh, uh, another case that Caroline mentioned in her uh, interesting opening, the court did not bother with the niceties of stare decisis and instead relied on compelled speech to overturn recent precedent. The justices reviewed an Illinois law that compelled non-unionized public employees to pay union agency fees for collective bargaining. The majority in that case relied on the exacting scrutiny test holding that the state of Illinois had failed to prove that compelling interest, a compelling interest could not be, quote, achieved through means significantly less restrictive on associational freedoms. In her dissent to Janus, Justice Kagan argued for an intermediate scrutiny standard that would give public employers substantial latitude about negotiating the terms of employment. Uh, the, First Amendment, the First Amendment safeguards individual and public expressions uninhibited by government orthodoxies. Courts regard compelled speech regulations to be suspect because of their potential to distort speakers' opinions. The Janus court found that a collective bargaining mandate forces an unwilling party to adopt arguments of a state-sponsored union, but the majority adopted a categorical view of free speech that virtually ignored the countervailing government and worker 
interests to bring a unified voice to the bargaining table. Missing two is a review of means analysis and uh, consideration of contextual distinctions between employment regulations and ideological censorship. In NIFLA and Janus, the court established a rigid preference for greater information against government priorities for health and collective bargaining. In closing, the government application of rules to all forms of compelled disclosure regulations risks oversimplified complex interpersonal legal disputes. Of late, uh, these cases have moved away from the anti-authoritarian framing of uh, West Virginia versus Barnett discourse about political, social, and other public issues, as then Justice Rehnquist put it, have a greater First Amendment value than the decision of a particular individual as to whether to purchase one or another kind of shampoo, as, as, he, as he, he's so funny, uh, as he put it so funnily, so, so humorously. Openly weighing private and public interests, means ends analysis, principled evaluation, and less restrictive assessment is critical to judicial transparency, public scrutiny, and predictability of free speech jurisprudence. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Alex, for that powerful description of the need for a nuanced and contextual balancing of the interests on both sides in compelled speech cases. Our next speaker is Professor David Hahn from the Pepperdine University Caruso School of Law and his paper is entitled Compelled Speech and Doctrinal Fluidity. Welcome, David. Thanks so much. Um, and first off, I'd like to thank Professor Corbin, uh, Professor Sessis, and the uh, editors of the Indiana Law Journal for uh, inviting me to participate in this really wonderful event. Um, so as I think everyone here can fully attest, First Amendment doctrine is notoriously sprawling and messy. Um, and that's certainly the case with compelled speech jurisprudence, which is, grown from its relatively simple beginnings into an expansive body of doctrine that's highly complex and conceptually murky. So what I wanna talk about today is whether the court is constructing compelled speech doctrine in a healthy manner. So a manner that's conducive to producing the sort of predictability and constraint and stability that are the hallmarks of a sound doctrinal framework. And my observations that as the court's compelled speech jurisprudence has grown increasingly complex, it's also manifested a troubling degree of what I'll call doctrinal fluidity. And this is a condition in which the doctrine becomes so imprecise or coherent or unstable that can easily be shaped by courts to plausibly justify a wide range of disparate results. So I'll describe the idea of doctrinal fluidity in general, um, then I'll highlight some indications of this fluidity uh, within some of the court's recent compelled speech cases. Um, I'll then talk a bit about the sources of this fluidity and then share some thoughts as to what can be done to address the issue. So since its relatively simple beginnings nearly 80 years ago in Barnett, um, compelled speech jurisprudence has sprawled into a doctrine of wide breadth and complexity. So it's expanded to cover, for example, you know, mandatory factual disclosures in commercial advertising, compelled subsidies of commercial speech, um, and compelled hosting of another speech on one's property. And the courts developed complex sets of rules and subrules in each of these contexts, including a wide array of doctrinal distinctions. And to a certain extent, this kind of growing complexity is just the natural result of the development of First Amendment doctrine as a whole. You know, we have this free speech clause with a sparse text and history, but its mandate seems incredibly broad. Um, so First Amendment doctrine has ultimately been constructed by courts kind of brick by brick through common law style development. And so as Fred Schauer has observed, it's natural that the First Amendment becomes increasingly sort of codified over time. You know, as we develop experience with different types of First Amendment problems, and as we start to see patterns, we can start to construct more complex sets of rules that are tailored for specific circumstances. So we have special doctrines regarding, for example, public forums or symbolic speech, defamation, and so on and so forth. But there's, I think, a difference between healthy complexity and unhealthy complexity. Now, a sound doctrinal framework will effectively constrain and channel courts' analyses in a way that's 
internally coherent and consistent with the underlying purposes of the First Amendment. Um, it should also be sufficiently stable that can be consistently and predictably relied upon. And it, should, and it should generally illuminate rather than obscure the theoretical reasons why we extend special constitutional protection to speech. And doctrinal complexity can certainly advance these goals. It allows for more nuance and precision in constraining and channeling courts analyses. But complexity can also produce a condition that I'll call doctrinal fluidity. So a doctrinally fluid framework is unstable, it's imprecise, it's incoherent. Um, and when this happens, the doctrine can't accomplish its intended function. So it can't meaningfully constrain court's decision-making. It undermines predictability. The doctrine becomes a kind of shifting morass of gaps and inconsistencies and ambiguities that's easily susceptible to cherry picking or manipulation depending on the court's preferred result. And under these circumstances, the complexity of the doctrine works to obscure rather than to illuminate. So doctrinal analysis might start to resemble a kind of ritual dance preceding a preordained result rather than a meaningfully constrained inquiry. So what should we make of the growing complexity of compelled speech doctrine? Well, to a certain extent, you know, this complexity is the inevitable result of the broad and complex range of issues that compelled speech doctrines come to encompass. So as the court confronts different kinds of compelled speech problems, it's natural for it to develop more precisely tailored doctrines. Um, but the court's compelled speech jurisprudence has also, I think, manifested a, a troubling degree of malleability and instability and incoherence, uh, particularly in its most recent decisions. Uh, so for example, in Nifla v. Becerra, um, the court struck down a California disclosure law that required certain licensed facilities providing family planning or pregnancy related services uh, to disseminate a government drafted notice on site. And this notice informed people of the availability of state programs providing access to family planning services, including contraception, prenatal care, and abortion. And now this notice closely resembled the mandated disclosure upheld in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, um, which required doctors performing abortions to first inform women of state published information regarding medical assistance for childbirth, you know, child support, and agencies that provide adoption and other services. And the Casey Joint Opinion had noted that this requirement just fit within the long established tort duty of doctors to obtain informed consent before performing medical procedures. But the NIFLA court argued that unlike in Casey, where the warnings were tied to a specific medical procedure, abortion, California's license notice wasn't, and thus it didn't fall within the broad rubric of informed consent to a medical procedure. Now, as Justice Breyer argued in his dissent, this distinction's, I think, not particularly persuasive. You know, prenatal care and giving birth both involve medical procedures, uh, just like abortion. And just as information about the possibility of adoption and childbirth help women make informed decisions as to having an abortion, information about the possibility of abortion help them make informed decisions about carrying a child to term and giving birth. It's likely that this fairly hair-splitting distinction didn't actually carry much weight in influencing the Nifla court's decision. You know, rather, the result seemed driven primarily by the court's sense that California was engaging in impermissible viewpoint-based discrimination. But the court's analysis produced a doctrinal distinction that you know, can either be marshaled again or shrunk to irrelevance in the future, depending on what result the court wants to reach. Just a couple of other examples that I'll touch on quickly. Um, so the NIFLA court also struck down a separate California law that required certain unlicensed facilities to provide a notice on site and in its advertising, basically stating that it's not a state licensed medical facility. But in striking it down, the court effectively ratcheted up uh, the highly deferential Zauder test, you know, one that had been articulated with the standard language of rational basis review into a far more stringent standard. And this kind of sh abrupt shift sort of muddies and destabilizes the doctrine as it now opens up the possibility in future cases of the court selecting between two different versions of Zauder, you know, the highly deferential uh, standard initially articulated or the more stringent intermediate scrutiny style standard that was applied in NIFLA. And finally, in Janus, the court overruled Abood, uh, 
uh, which had upheld the mandatory collection of agency fees from non-union public employees um, that are used to support the union's uh, collective bargaining activities. And putting aside the substance of uh, the court's criticism of Abood, I think it's difficult to dispute much of Justice Kagan's critique of the court's stare decisis analysis in overruling Abood. You know, Abood was a 40-year-old decision that had long been heavily relied upon by state employers and unions. You know, it had been cited and relied upon in numerous Supreme Court cases, and it didn't appear particularly unworkable or or at least it wasn't any less workable than countless other blurry lines within First Amendment doctrine. And this, of course, serves to further destabilize the doctrinal framework. So as Randy Kozel has observed, when stare decisis is weak, it fails to breed confidence that judges are acting as part of this kind of unified judiciary, it instead breeds suspicion of rhetorical cover in service of individual agendas. So what's the ultimate source of this malleability and stability within compelled speech doctrine. Well, much of the fluidity of the doctrine is, I think, rooted in two fundamental characteristics of modern First Amendment jurisprudence, the lack of a singular and coherent theoretical in underpinning for the protection of speech, and the rapid expansion of First Amendment coverage to a wide and eclectic variety of communicative contexts. So broadly speaking, the contours of First Amendment doctrine fundamentally rest on the broad theoretical rationales as to why speech is entitled to a special degree of protection as compared to non-speech conduct. You know, rationales that can't really be gleaned from the sparse text and historical background of the free speech clause. And there's at this point a fairly standard set of candidate theories for this special uh, protection of speech. So the pursuit of truth, uh, the promotion of democratic self-governance, individual autonomy, uh, checking government abuse, but the courts never settled on any singular theoretical basis for protecting speech. And this has produced a First Amendment doctrine that's often theoretically muddled in which different speech values may overlap and conflict in particular cases. And this theoretical instability is magnified in the context of compelled speech doctrine, given the special importance of autonomy-based rationales in the doctrine. You know, unlike traditional cases dealing with speech restrictions where instrumental theories tend to take on uh, central importance. So unlike narrower instrumental theories, autonomy-based theories are notoriously open-ended, right? simply because arguably all human conduct beyond speech can be characterized as playing an important role in individual self-realization. Um, and autonomy considerations can also apply to either speakers or listeners that further complicates matters. So this all translates to a sort of broad fluidity in the doctrinal options that are available to the court in compelled speech cases as theoretical considerations do little to constrain it from pushing the doctrine wherever it pleases. So the second source of this doctrinal instability is the rapid expansion of First Amendment doctrine from the narrow confines of ideological speech in its earliest years uh, to the expansive and highly eclectic First Amendment of today. So one that covers commercial speech and violent video games and the distribution of consumer data and so on and so forth. And this rapid expansion has destabilized First Amendment doctrine in two connected ways. So first, it's put significant pressure on the speech conduct distinction. So that is whether regulated activities constitute speech within the coverage of the First Amendment or non-speech conduct outside of the First Amendment's boundaries. And the court's jurisprudence regarding this distinction is famously muddled and underdeveloped. So without any meaningful doctrinal or theoretical boundaries, the litigants and courts are free to constantly push the boundaries of the First Amendment outwards. And this effect is magnified in the compelled speech doctrine, simply because in the, in the modern regulatory state, we're of course constantly required to do and say things that we may not want to do or say. And second, the expansion of the First Amendment's coverage has produced significant tension with the traditional doctrinal framework. And this tension arises from the disconnect between a kind of legacy doctrine that was originally developed and calibrated to ideological speech and the expansive coverage of the First Amendment as it stands today. So traditional doctrine, 
most notably the cornerstone rule that all content-based restrictions on speech are subject to strict scrutiny, it broadly assumes a First Amendment that's sort of unitary and universal rather than eclectic and piecemeal. But the traditional doctrine just doesn't fit with many of the novel speech contexts that courts are now confronting, and this has created significant friction. So this has in turn produced two diametrically opposed analytical modes within the, the court's First Amendment jurisprudence. So some cases like United States v. Stevens and Reed v. Town of Gilbert reflect the traditional mode of analysis. You know, again, viewing First Amendment doctrine as largely unitary in nature and assuming stringent protection of all speech falling within the First Amendment's coverage with only very narrow exceptions. But other cases like the early low value speech and commercial speech cases reflect an eclectic mode of analysis. You know, one that views the doctrine as nuanced and segmented and is therefore more amenable to open balancing conflicting speech values and harms anew anytime novel problems arise. Now, this tension between the two modes of analysis has generally arisen in the more typical First Amendment context of speech restrictions and many aspects of traditional First Amendment doctrine don't clearly map onto the compelled speech context. But the court has often applied the doctrine governing speech restrictions to compelled speech, and the court clearly did so in NIFLA, you know, adopting the framing and rhetoric of the traditional analytical mode. And this gives the court the freedom to kind of toggle between these two modes of analysis and lines of cases as it chooses. So what can be done to counteract this kind of doctrinal fluidity within compelled speech doctrine? Well, the most direct solution might be for the court to fully embrace a singular, robust theoretical basis for speech protection. So rooting the doctrine upon a singular and narrow theoretical footing, like the promotion of democratic self-governance, would allow the court to craft a more stable and robust speech conduct distinction. Um, it would limit the coverage of the First Amendment to a more manageable and coherent scope. Uh, but this solution is highly unrealistic, right? simply because it runs squarely against the prevailing popular and judicial conception of First Amendment coverage. So for better or for worse, we've broadly embraced a vision of the First Amendment that's expansive and messy and theoretically diverse, you know, one that's concerned not only with restrictions on ideological speech, but also with artistic speech, commercial speech, you know, various speech compulsions, and so forth. And given the court's continued expansion of the First Amendment scope, it's highly unlikely that any contraction of the doctrine is on the horizon. So maybe we can hope for a change in the court's present culture to one that's more suited to developing stronger and more holistic doctrinal frameworks. So much of the instability of the present doctrine might be attributed to the court's readiness to reverse or significantly modify pre-existing doctrines whenever five votes can be mustered for a desired result. Um, and this sort of case-by-case -case appro approach is of course not the recipe for a coherent and stable doctrinal framework. So perhaps if the court were to adopt a more holistic posture that more strongly prioritized doctrinal consistency, predictability, and stability in its decisions, it would be better able to craft a more coherent and less fluid doctrinal framework. But this is also pretty unlikely, as there are no indications that the culture of the court will change anytime soon, um, as indicated by cases like Janus. So maybe it's inevitable that highly contested areas of First Amendment jurisprudence are basically ideological and philosophical battlegrounds where the doctrine by itself holds little actual persuasive or justificatory force. Um, and in these areas, the, the doctrine's complexity cloaks its problematic fluidity, right? its capacity to again shift and expand or contract to accommodate a wide range of divergent results. So if we can't realistically fix the problem of doctrinal fluidity, maybe the best we can hope for is a court that approaches cases in an analytically transparent manner. Uh, one that lays bare the fundamental intuitions and value judgments upon which it's actually basing its decisions. And this sort of approach would at least allow courts and society at large to discuss and debate these fundamental questions openly rather than through a kind of doctrinal facade. So perhaps the court in constructing First Amendment doctrine should emulate the way that 
say, common law courts approach negligence doctrine. Um, you know, after all, both doctrines are practically constructed through the same common law style development. Um, and crafting First Amendment doctrine poses similar challenges as crafting negligence doctrine. You know, both are rooted in murky theoretical foundations. Both represent this attempt to impose some order and coherence upon a near infinite range of possible factual circumstances. So negligence determinations broadly and openly reflect the values and intuitions of the particular community in determining appropriate standards of care. And because it's centered around a singular open-ended standard of how a reasonable person would act under the circumstances, the cases tend to be analyzed and decided in a kind of direct and unvarnished and pragmatic manner. Now, on the face of things, it may seem really unwise to approach First Amendment doctrine in this manner. Um, one of the persistent themes within First Amendment jurisprudence is a deep skepticism of courts integrating their own value judgments and delineating the boundaries of speech protection. But these sorts of conflicting value judgments and intuitions are often the actual driving force behind the court's decisions. So if there's any hope of theoretical and doctrinal stability emerging from the current morass, then it will likely only be accomplished through the establishment of a kind of broad cultural consensus right, between courts and legislatures and society at large um, regarding fundamental speech values and how they interact with government prerogatives rather than any robust system of doctrinal constraint. And such consensus, if it's achievable, is more likely to arise through the sort of open dialogue that's spurred by forthright and transparent acknowledgement of the underlying values driving the court's decisions, um, you know, the sort of frank and foundational discussion that's natural to negligence context. And finally, um, the broad design of negligence doctrine might offer some guidance as to how the court could adjust the contours of First Amendment doctrine to facilitate this kind of open dialogue. So again, negligence doctrine is formulated around a simple open-ended standard, like the reasonable person standard. And this necessarily requires courts to delve directly into the sorts of value judgments and intuitions that underlie the analysis. So maybe certain aspects of First Amendment doctrine might benefit from an incremental move towards what we might call decodification, right? Stripping away complex rule-like approaches in favor of simpler open-ended standards. Although complexity can again strengthen doctrine, it can also distance courts, uh, courts analyses from the underlying foundational judgments driving the doctrine. And when the doctrine becomes so fluid and unstable that it fails to adequately constrain, its capacity to obscure rather than illuminate comes with little benefit other than the appearance of law-like constraint. So to the extent that the court's decisions actually come down to conflicting foundational judgments regarding say why speech should be protected or the appropriate scope of government regulation, um, it should move towards simpler, uh, more standard-like approaches that push courts to articulate these judgments more openly. Now, I'm, not, I'm certainly not arguing that the court should throw out its entire repertoire of rules and sub-rules and exceptions in favor of say a singular open-ended standard like in the negligence context, but incremental moves towards decodification, right? Like selectively adopting open proportionality style analyses in certain doctrinal contexts uh, may be beneficial and also perhaps plausible um, given their uh, compatibility with the current jurisprudential approaches of Justice Breyer uh, and Justice Kagan. Uh, so I'm out of time, so I'll stop there. Uh, thanks so much. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much, uh, David. That was uh, a fascinating critique of the problematic complexity and fluidity of compelled speech doctrine and a clear call for a more transparent account of the values underlying it. Our third speaker um, is Professor Alan Chen from the University of Denver Sturm College of Law. And his paper is entitled Compelled Speech Doctrine and the Regulatory State. Welcome, Alan. Uh, thank you. Um, and thanks to Alex and to Caroline for putting this symposium together and especially to Caitlin and the other editors uh, at the Indiana Law Journal and to the law school for hosting uh, this great event. It's great to see everybody, how, even if it's virtual. Um, 
So uh, as you can already tell from the first two papers, uh, compelled speech doctrine is a mess. Uh, there's, uh, I would say, I, my, the original title for my paper was the compelled speech doctrines, uh, suggesting that there are multiple strands of and context in which the, the law arises. Um, and it's, it's uh, I, I think in some ways an insurmountable challenge to try to organize uh, all the different contexts in which compelled speech laws are, are, uh, are, are examined by the courts. Uh, so my focus is a little bit narrower. Um, uh, although there are these multiple contexts in which the compelled speech doctrine arises, uh, the limited focus of my essay is on the distinction, an important distinction, I believe, that between compelled ideological statements, uh, such as the Pledge of Allegiance and compelled statements of fact, or a, a, a sort of public uh, fact disclosures that are required under uh, state and federal laws and regulations. The Supreme Court has sometimes suggested that compelled factual statements, even if true, com com compromise some of the same speech interests as compelled ideological expression. In Riley versus National Federation for the Blind, for example, the court struck down a state law requiring professional fundraisers to disclose to potential donors the average percentage of gross receipts that went to the charities that hired them. In other words, as you uh, to inform potential donors that uh, if you give $100, 20, 20 of those dollars are going to the uh, fundraiser and $80 are going to the actual program uh, at the organization. Though the information was truthful and served the interest of informing listeners or potential donors, the court held that the law burdened the fundraiser's free speech rights and subjected the regulation to strict scrutiny, uh, striking it down. Uh, in other compelled fact cases, however, the Supreme Court and the lower federal courts have applied what I think can be generously described as a patchwork of doctrinal analyses uh, without, out, without outlining a consistent approach. Uh, for example, in the Zotterer case that was mentioned uh, in one of the earlier, by one of the earlier speakers, the court upheld an Ohio professional conduct regulation that required lawyers who advertised that they would represent clients under on a contingent fee basis to disclose whether those clients would have to pay costs as opposed to fees if the case was unsuccessful. There, the Supreme Court applied a much more deferential standard, suggesting that the disclosure was permissible as long as, as it was, quote, reasonably related to the state's interest in preventing deception of consumers, unquote. The extent to which Zotter applies to other contexts outside of professional advertising has been heavily contested uh, both in the Supreme Court and um, in the lower federal courts. And then in NIFLA, the NIFLA versus Becerra, which you uh, heard about already a lot today and you're gonna hear about more, um, uh, the Supreme Court decided in a 5-4 vote uh, to strike down the California law requiring these self-styled crisis pregnancy centers to post and distribute information about the availability of state-sponsored and state-funded services, including abortion, uh, for pregnant women, and where the centers were not licensed to provide medical services to disclose that simple fact. In my paper, I argue that the NIFLA decision represents a dramatic shift in compelled speech doctrine as it applies to government-compelled factual disclosures. One that, if taken to its logical extreme, uh, could lead to the dismantling of the regulatory state, not to be too alarmist about it. Um, the court's objection to the California law in, uh, uh, in NIFLA was that unlike the regulation in Zotterer, it was not limited to the requirement that the speaker disclose, quote, purely factual and uncontroversial information. The license notice requiring the posting of information about state-sponsored services, including abortion, the court said was, quote, anything but an uncontroversial topic. This purely uh, factual and uncontroversial information language, which originated in Zotterer, actually, uh, uh, um, lower, uh, has, has caused a lot of confusion and lower courts have struggled to articulate what it means for a governmental, for government compelled disclosures to include a, quote, controversial fact. Uh, examples of things that have been challenged in lower courts over the years since Zotter, and these are actually pre-NIFLA cases, and most of them are, uh, requiring securities issuers to disclose whether the firms they represent uh, used, quote, conflict minerals uh, in the manufacturing of 
the products that they sold. Well, the tobacco companies could be required to include not only written health warnings, but also graphical images depicting the health consequences of smoking. And whether the government can require meat producers who sell meat in the United States to label their products by their country of origin. NIFLA is a particularly pernicious example, I believe, of what could turn into a broader application of this uncontroversial fact standard and could lead to efforts to undermine scores of regulations. First, as you've already heard a little bit of a hint of, in the post-New post Deal America, government required factual disclosures are ubiquitous. Professionals are routinely required to display their licenses to practice. Physicians must secure informed consent from their patients by telling them uh, about the risks, the reasonable risks associated with the procedures they're about to undergo. Uh, businesses in banking and the securities industries must provide all sorts of information in compliance with financial regulations. Employers must post signs about matters such as workers' rights and occupational safety. Consumer products are laden with government required disclosures from drug safety information to nutritional content on processed foods to warnings about extremely hazardous materials and products. Although the NIFLA majority stated that, quote, we do not question the legality of health and safety warnings long considered permissible or purely factual and uncontroversial disclosures about commercial products, it completely failed to explain why those would be different from the disclosures required by the California FACT Act. Nor are individuals free from regulations that require compelled factual disclosures. Uh, we, we must provide information to the government about the amount and sources of our incomes and other private financial information in our annual federal and state tax returns. Other personal information must be revealed to the government as part of the application for things as routine as driver's licenses or for those who are applying for hunting licenses and gun licenses. In most states, convicted sex offenders are required in, uh, to report their name, the offense they were convicted of, and at their address on databases available to the general public. Like business and institutional disclosure requirements, many of these personal disclosure requirements are purely factual, that is not ideological, like the Pledge of Allegiance. Importantly, unlike in the case of compelled ideological speech, while these laws may affect speakers' autonomy interests, they simultaneously advance important, other important free speech interests for listeners, which are not at stake when the government compels uh, ideological statements. That is, most public disclosure requirements are designed or those primarily designed to inform the public or to inform consumers or patients or others uh, so that they can fully uh, make decisions, whether those are in the medical context, the legal con context, or the consumer context. Um, so the ubiquity of factual disclosures um, juxtaposed with the purely factual and ideological information statement from uh, NIFLA uh, presents significant pragmatic and doctrinal problems uh, in trying to tie the fir this First Amendment standard to whether a fact is controversial or not. The court's decisions offer no guidance about this, either in Zauderer or in NIFLA. Indeed, the concept of a controversial, truthful, factual statement, I, I argue, is not internally coherent. Uh, facts should not be, in and of themselves, controversial. They only become controversial either because people disagree about their truth or because the context in which they arise or they're compelled makes their presentation controversial in some other way. So what are the possible ways in which we could view a fact as controversial? Well, first, a fact might be controversial only because the regulated party objects to its disclosure. Uh, the law cannot, but the law cannot tolerate a regime under which a regulated party can escape a compelled disclosure requirement simply by objecting to its pronouncement and thereby making them controversial. Uh, Professor Post and Professor Shauna Schifrin have both made this point um, in their scholarship. So that can't be the, that cannot be the problem. A fact might be controversial because the words used to describe that fact uh, might be value laden or judgment laden. That is the fact in and of itself is truthful and uncontroversial, but the language the government prescribes, the specific script the government hands to the speaker characterizes the fact in a way that makes it controversial. 
So for example, in the conflict minerals case, there was a dispute about whether uh, the description of conflict minerals, which were acquired during an African civil war, um, whether the actual description as conflict minerals was a value judgment as opposed to a purely factual statement. Um, in the uh, American Meat Institute case, um, although this, this later was mooted out of the case, the original uh, federal regulation required uh, in terms of labeling uh, meat products from, by their country of origin, that the labels say, quote, slaughtered um, in Canada or slaughtered in the United States, um, which the uh, parties objected to. Again, the argument being that slaughtering is a particular characterization of ki the killing of an animal that, that bears in, it, in and of itself a value judgment. Um, so compel compelling value-laden language begins to resemble some of the compelled ideological speech problems if the character, characterizations move from the descriptive to the judgmental. But here I would argue that the problem is not that the statements are controversial, but that in the court's words, they are no longer purely factual. By adding these descriptive elements to the phrasing or to the script that results in the characterization of the fact uh, in the framework of a particular value, the regulators may violate the First Amendment not by introducing controversy, but by adding an ideological or value-laden component to an otherwise objective statement of truthful fact. The point is here that describing factual disclosures as controversial is not doing any of the work. If anything, it is superfluous in that if a statement involves not bare facts, but an ideologically biased characterization of those facts it is no longer purely factual and therefore bleeds over into a form of compelled ideological statement. In other words, the word controversial in, as used in NIFLA does no work. Finally, a fact might be controversial because the speaker disagrees that it is true. Here it's worth considering compelled speech doctrine in our current social and political climate, where seemingly every fact can be and is contested. And we are living, we are living in a state of what I would call epistemic anarchy. If as a society, we cannot agree about basic facts, such as who won a closely watched presidential election or whether masks can reduce the spread of a highly contagious virus. It begs the question whether we can distinguish an argument over a fact from an ideological dispute. That is, truthfulness is turned into ideology. Thus blurring the, sti distinct, the distinction between compelled ideological speech and compelled fact disclosures. But it, cannot, it simply cannot be that because a noticeable portion of the population disagrees or does not believe in a particular fact, that it thereby automatically becomes controversial for the purposes of compelled speech doctrine. Now note that of these three objections to controversial facts, it is only the first one that seems to be the case in NIFLA. It would seem that both the unlicensed notice and the licensed notice include bare facts rather than characterizations of those facts. It is not disputed, for example, and the plaintiffs did not dispute that the state does provide free and low cost pregnancy services, including abortion, or that unlicensed clinics are uh, truly not licensed to perform medical services. That was not the basis of NIFLA's objection. No words included in the disclosure are tainted with value laden language, unless one were to argue that the word abortion in and is in and of itself ideological. Um, in short, the only object objection of the three characterizations of what a controversial fact are that I described is that NIFLA seems to disagree with their dis factual disclosure. And again, we cannot put the regulated party in charge of making a fact controversial by saying that its very, that, that its very expression makes it controversial. Ultimately in the paper, I argue that in the vast majority of cases, the First Amendment does not require any heightened standard of review where the compel compulsion is a, a truthful factual statement. The default rule regarding state compelled factual statements ought to be that they do not violate the First Amendment so long as, they are in the, as the facts are indeed objectively true, the disclosure is reasonable in content and in scope, and the publication of the fact advances legitimate state interests in informing the public. I argue that none of the traditional free speech concerns with compelled ideological speech arise in the context of compelled factual statements. First, as long as we avoid the value-laden or judgment-laden language, there does not seem to be a viewpoint discrimination problem. 
the government is not substituting its views for that of the speaker in the same way it does when it compels an ideological expression. Second, there is not what I call a misattribution problem. Listers will hardly confuse the speaker with the government's prescribed message, particularly if the regulation does not prohibit counter speech. Uh, as was pointed out, I think, by Alex in his talk, uh, the, the California law uh, at issue in the NIFLA case did not, uh, did not forbid the regulated parties from posting their own signs right next to the required governmental disclosure saying abortion is murder or the state, this, this, this sign will lead you to state-sponsored murder. Um, they could express their own views uh, out both inside and outside of the context of the compelled speech regulation. And finally, while there could be in theory some impact on the speaker's deliberative autonomy, such interests I argue are far less of an issue in the context of regulations that adhere to businesses or organizations and institutions, which do not share the same dignitary interests that we should respect uh, in, under the First Amendment in individuals. Um, so that's basically a, a, the, the, the gist of my paper and I, I welcome uh, your questions and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Alan, uh, for focusing on this particular problem of compelled speech as a requirement of factual disclosure and connecting it to some of the epistemological problems we're experiencing in our politics today. Um, that was fascinating. So I think at this point, what we're gonna do is we're gonna open the conversation up just to the panelists to see if any of them would like to make comments or ask questions of each other before we move on to uh, the rest of the symposium participants. So panelists, I think since there are only three of you, uh, you probably don't even need to use your hands. You can just jump in. <laughs> I'll ask a first question. Um, I, I, I think that uh, I enjoyed both of your papers very much. Uh, uh, there's a little bit of tension between them, um, I think. Uh, Alex is talking uh, for an increase in the contextualization of the examination of compelled speech, and David seems to be looking for more certainty. Um, although even, uh, actually, I should, I should say that David's paper itself is internally a little bit in tension with itself, because the idea of moving toward a negligence-type standard um, does seem to be at cross-purposes to having a, a a, a more clear, a clearer set of rules or doctrines that we can apply. So I was interested to hear you respond to each other. Um, well, I, I could say uh, the tension you you note is correct is, is absolutely right, and I think it's because in the end, I think there's only a kind of second best solution that we can come up with. The first best solution is that we can create a coherent doctrine. I just honestly am skeptical that that's possible given the kind of current uh, nature of First Amendment doctrine, the way courts decide cases. Um, and the, again, the kind of the lack of a sort of stable theoretical foundation, you can, it's, it's, it's kind of, you can kind of push the doctrine anywhere. So um, I think if we get to coherence, so one way to think about this is there's, it doesn't mean the doctrine's not fully incoherent in all places, right? So we all, I think, I think everyone will agree that, you know, Barnett was correctly decided, right? I think everyone will agree, at least now, uh, for now, I should say that standard uh, informed consent disclosures before a medical procedure, those are all constitutional. I think we'll all agree with that, but I don't think we agree. With, my sense is we don't, the reason why we agree with these propositions is because we have this kind of broadly shared cultural consensus as to how kind of speech values and government prerogatives interact in those circumstances. Um, and so it's that kind of consensus, I think that leads to consistency and predictability in the doctrine as opposed to this kind of robust uh, system of doctrinal constraint, right? So if we can't, now, can we ever get to that consensus on these, on these kinds of highly contested areas of First Amendment doctrine? Maybe not, but if we can't, at least we should bring everything out into the open, right? So I think my, my, the, the sense is that um, sort of as Alex proposes, if we have a kind of more, more proportionality style analyses, Right, which is why I sort of draw the parallel to negligence doctrine. At least everything's out in the open. And even if there's never any consensus or consistency or agreement, at least we're now having an open conversation about what's actually driving the doctrine and not having this kind of, you know, arguments about you know, what, like, for example, you'll see lots of arguments in lots of cases that are kind of, as Alex notes, 
what is the degree of scrutiny we use, right? And there's all these kinds of like thin slicing going on. Well, here's why we should be using exacting scrutiny, whatever that means, right? Or here's why we should use, you know, some other type of scrutiny. And that often kind of becomes this masked conversation about really what's essentially a, a conflict of, well, you know, what are the government's legitimate regulatory interests and are they outweighed by the individual's constitutional interests in say remaining silent in a particular case? So, uh, so Alan, I, I would say that I, I think you're right. I think I'm just skeptical that we can really ever get to that kind of consistency. So we may as well just bring everything out into the open. And in that, I actually think our, our uh, ideas overlap on proportionality, which is uh, bringing everything in the open, except that I define everything in the open as being the speaker's interests, government's countervailing concerns, means ends consideration, alternative channels of communication. And then I, I actually think we do have specific doctrines already in free speech, right? Uh, the self-expression, self self-determination, uh, informational. There, there are certain non-controversial issues. Philosophy can't be suppressed. Uh, history can't be suppressed. Uh, art can't be suppressed. We already have very broad terms in which we conceptualize uh, speech and, and what's happening, in, what I think is happening with the cate categories and what I'm trying to put out particularly is that they're being used for ideological purpose without uh, adequately, what David is saying, unpackaging uh, all the interests that are at stake in a particular piece of litigation, which goes to Article Three, standing uh, and ripeness issues. Uh, Alan, uh, I wanted to just uh, ask you, I, I love both of your papers. I thought they were absolutely fascinating. I always learn from the two of you. Uh, and um, uh, the you're distinguishing uh, truth and ideology, but that obviously itself is a very complex uh, step that in and of itself has a lot of ambiguity. And I wonder particularly how Alvarez, the case that allows for uh, lies as being protected self-expression in cases where someone doesn't seek a monetary gain. And the New York Times v. Sullivan, right, which just says that inevitably in ideological discussions, there's going to be falsehoods, uh, how that might play into your interpretation of the, just the complexity of identifying truthful speech from ideology, particularly given the court's recent doctrine. And then uh, David, I noticed in your paper, there was this constant running of self-government. It seemed to me that you were strongly leaning on that. In fact, this is the first paper I remember you strongly leaning uh, to, to that. Uh, and I wonder whether you might speak to uh, those issues. Oh, and then one more thing about the, you talked about the average person and well, the, the negligence standard. I wonder how reasonable person Jesse has spoken about this in terms of uh, establishment clause issues. You know, we have that reasonable person in, in the endorsement standard, Justice O'Connor has, has adopted. Could, is there any overlap? You wanna go first or you want me? Uh, 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 it's, a, it's a good point. I mean, I, I think that, I think both, so a couple of things, uh, Alvarez and New York Times are both about uh, censorship of speech as opposed to compelled speech. Um, so how would we translate to that to a compelled uh, fact statement regulation? I guess you could have a compelled um, exaggerated speech, I guess, uh, but I think that would fall into my, uh, my problematic character the, where the language characterizes the truth, the objective fact in a, in a value specific way. Um, and Alvarez says you can you can lie, but um, uh, you, you you can lie, but it, unless it causes a tangible harm, uh, right? And so uh, this complicates things because uh, the, well, this goes into something I didn't touch on. I touched on the paper a little bit, but not not in the in the talk, uh, which is to what degree is compelled or compelled factual statements government speech? Um, and of course, if it's government speech, there is no First Amendment limitation, but um, I mean, I suppose that you could have a situation, again, if you go to NIFLA, the, the plaintiffs did not contest that the state provided these services. They just didn't want to put them up on their wall right, or in their advertising. So it wasn't a question of a dispute over the existence of that service. It was an ideological opposition to abortion or to the to state, to state funded abortion in that case. So I'm not quite sure, I'll have to think about it, but I'm not quite sure. I suppose you could have a situation where uh, there is actually a dispute over the fact, um, 
But again, you can't you can't be just because the regulated party disagrees with the truth of the fact that that makes it unconstitutional because um, that that then they could just sim simply say I don't think that's true. I don't think it's true that the state requires provides these services, so I'm not going to say it. Um, and I suppose there could be a, a circumstance in which no, if I guess there'd be a hypothetical where the government actually compels somebody to say an, uh, an untrue fact, an objectively untrue fact, uh, but that, but that again, the work is done by purely factual, right? Not 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 uncontroversial. The controversial, uh, the introduction of the, the phrase controversial is what I think is problematizes the doctrine. So, uh, and Alex, I'd say that. Um... I wouldn't say I'm pushing for the democratic self-governance kind of that's the the that should be the sort of core and sole theoretical basis for protecting speech. I do think that I talk about it because I think that's the one most often proposed that if we're going to pick one, maybe that's the one we should pick. And there's lots of there've been lots of arguments for that. Um, but I, I I mean I tend to think of the First Amendment as kind of you know it's there are a lot of reasons why you want to protect speech and it's messy and that's just kind of what we have and we kind of try to deal with it as best we can. That also, I think, is how the court has kind of dealt with it. Um, and I think on the on the sort of reasonable person versus the and the establishment clause sort of context. I mean, it's it the reasonable person standard is sort of notoriously hard to pin down. But I think that's the reason why the sort of the common law is this really elegant way that courts have kind of approached it. Right? It's it's this it's the common law system is basically this on ongoing long running conversation, right? From court to court, from era to era. Um, where we have this kind of open standard and we kind of have a conversation about it, right? And courts are very upfront in the, in the common law context, courts are pretty upfront about it. You know, though, so to the extent a court in the negligence context is saying, we're gonna look at this through a kind of instrumental, you know, uh, you know least cost avoider lens or something like that, they'll, they, they often will, will articulate that to the extent they say, no, we're gonna view this in a kind of corrective justice, um, sort of lens, they kind of talk about it in that way. Um, so, uh, so I do think that it's it's the vagueness of it is what makes it kind of spectacularly unhelpful, but it's also its value, right? The value is that it's, it, it sort of forces you to have this kind of conversation about it. Um, but, but Alex, I, I want to ask you, because um, you, you know, you, you, you talk about proportionality and kind of just taking these kind of proportionality based approaches. Um, and I wonder how far you think we should push that. Like, because you can think of an extreme example where you could say, um, you know, we're going to do away with all doctrine. And this is going to be the, the universal test. You know, government compulsions to speak are unconstitutional when the government's legitimate regulatory interests are outweighed by the individual's constitutional interest in remaining silent. Right. That's like a, so would you go so far as to say it should all be sort of proportionality or so. So how far would you push that? Is there room for any kind of formal doctrine? Um, and Alan, really quickly, um, I, I, have, I was wondering if you could just sort of speak a little bit more about sort of the, uh, and I think you talked about this sort of at the, at the end of your paper, the idea of um, we have, uh, you know, the, the fact that these factual disclosures are mandated kind of makes them valuated to a certain extent, right? So, and, and I think the idea here is the sort of, uh, I think you talk about this as kind of, you're asking for a purely factual, uh, disclosure, but it may, not, it may not have a whole lot to do with what's actually going on. Um, and so how do you sort of account for that? I think you touched on it a little bit in your talk and you touched it in your paper, but I am interested in that because I think there's the risk of, no one will disagree with this statement, but uh, there is this sense that it's there for an obvious reason, it's there for an obvious sort of agenda. And we do that all the time, but usually it's for good reasons, but then we're now we're in the business of deciding what are good reasons or not. I guess I should go first. I mean, I, of course, I think there's room for doctrine, but I think that part of the balancing and the proportionality is taking the Bobidian modalities that you, you do take into doctrine. In other words, proportionality in context is you do take uh, uh, doctrine into account, but you take history into account and structure and the prudence of the case as well, which are issues of economic concern and health. And so I, I the... Uh, and I also think that there are just core things that we that all the justices seem to agree on, which is matters of philosophy, politics, art, uh, history. These are just protected uh, matters of discussion. But 
uh, I think the purpose of uh, proportionality and where I think your project and my project overlap is the transparency aspect of it, where I think that the court has continuously been ideologically driven. And, and in fact, the court isn't in, in, in the court's categorical own categorical approach. I don't think it's following stare decisis. And that's uh, the, the point of uh, what Alan was saying about uh, not following Zauderer, but what I was saying about Barnett as well, but in lots of other cases, you know, the, the statement from Reed that all content-based regulation gets strict scrutiny is just nonsense. It's nonsense. The stuff that uses categorical approach, for example, in Stevens, which strikes the, uh, the, the uh, uh, act that prohibited the, the distribution of violent video or violence committed against animals, animal cruelty, the court says, these doctrines of categories go back to 1791. It is false. It is incorrect. He starts, he talks about uh, uh, obscenity, he talks about pornography, child pornography, things that didn't exist, incitement, they didn't exist in 1791. So it, it, the court claims it's objective, but, uh, you know, I I'm sorry, and Susan wants to break in and, and, and I'd love to hear the audience. Uh, so I, I'd prefer that to listen to my own voice anyway. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Alex. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I want to I wanna be able to open this up a little bit more. Um, Alan, I know that there was a question directed at you, if you could answer it briefly so we can then get some other conversation going. Sure. Um, uh, there, in, in my in my sort of reasonableness test, there's a germaneness requirement. So the the regulation, the disclosure has to be reasonably related to the underlying government interest involved. So you can't have some. You can't just basically say uh, something that's completely unrelated to the purpose of the regulation or require them, even if it is true. Um, that would go beyond the reasonable scope test. Thank you so much. Now, Carolyn has a question and I have a question. And if anyone else does, please uh, put it in the chat so that I'll know you're in the queue, okay? All um, right. Um, so I have a couple of questions. One is for David. I would love for you to provide uh, a specific example of your approach applied to a case and how your approach would have made the case come out differently. Um, and then for Alan, I completely agree with you that distinction between ideological speech and factual speech is one that must make a difference when we're dealing with compelled disclosures. I do think the line is not always, it's not quite as crisp as you're trying to make it out. I appreciate you trying to draw that line. Here are a couple of other things perhaps to think about is what about if it's a mandatory um, disclosure of an image? And so here I'm thinking about the tobacco warnings of very graphic pictures that were 100% accurate. And yet um, they really were packed quite an emotional punch. Um, and related, but also slightly different is how does your approach apply to mandatory ultrasounds? Where under your discussion, it sounds like, well, it's just the picture Right, and then if the doctor has to describe the image, that's accurate, and yet somehow that does not quite seem the same as what you're thinking about. And so that's one thing, and those are sort of, I guess, uh, and then another question I have is maybe what makes something controversial, another thing that might make something controversial, is not whether the statement itself is accurate or not accurate, but, and this I think is part of David's point is what was the purpose of the disclosure? And I think there might be a difference between mandatory factual disclosures that are merely meant to inform versus mandatory factual disclosures that are meant to persuade. Um, and maybe that makes a difference. And maybe some things that the government tries to persuade you of are okay, um, that maybe some are not. And so you might have to go beyond merely the accuracy of the statement to decide whether you think it's in your okay side of the line versus your problematic side of the line. Uh, so I'll, I'll answer uh, the question really quickly. Um, so I don't actually think it'll change results. Um, I think it's more about, again, sort of ha making everything more open. And I think it is a quick example of that might be like in Janus, right? So Janus, a huge part of the analysis on both in the majority and the dissent is, is a battle over what's the right standard of scrutiny, 
right? So Justice Alito says it's this is exacting scrutiny. Again, whatever that means, it's exacting scrutiny. Um, Justice Kagan says, no, this is basically, we apply Pickering, basically a Pickering style analysis. Um, and a lot of it comes into that kind of, again, thin slicing to like, okay, does it fall into this category or that category? Um, and I, I would just prefer that they just have the, 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 the debate, that they bring out all the values behind that kind of you know, doctrinal debate into the open. So um, I don't think it'll necessarily change things, but I do think it will at least establish a sort of more open dialogue that would sort of establish the conditions where they could have a more open debate about these kinds of fundamental values. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for those great questions, Carolyn. Um, uh, on the graphic images uh, hypothetical, which is not that's from the R.J. Reynolds case out of the D.C. Circuit. Um, uh, so that might fall into my characterization of facts as opposed to just a statement of fact. Um, you could make an argument that the emotional appeal of the image uh, is doing more than convey the actual literal health warning that smoking can cause you to have a lung disease that may eventually result in a tracheotomy, which I think one of the images is actually somebody smoking out of a tracheotomy. Uh, whole. Um, uh, in terms of the ultrasound, so the mandatory ultrasound is conduct, not speech. But if the if the requirement is that the doctor has to just has to inform the patient of gestational age or other factors about uh, the fetus or the, the image, I, I think that's a good hypo um, that I have to think about a little bit more. That sort of again. Uh, leads over to your third question, which is that really just intended to persuade as opposed to, or influence as opposed to inform. Um, uh, so I don't have a great answer to that. And um, so I think that there's a difference between the government persuading through compelled speech and the government persuading through external speech or alternative means. And so uh, I think there are some circumstances in which, so I think the government can, and I know this is not a clean distinction, should be able to inform or just uh, inform the third listeners with the compelled speech and the, but they, their persuasion has to come through um, more direct means like, you know, and sort of that was the, the, the majority's opinion in, in NIFLA is like, well, if the government can put a billboard uh, outside the NIFLA offices and that says where the portions or services are available. Um, but uh, I, those are definitely things I need to fine tune a little bit before the paper is published. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and I have a question, which again, I hope you can be brief in response to. It's really for all panelists because we do have at least two questions from attendees as well. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about how the various reflections on doctrine that you all offered would refer back to the theoretical issues um, that arise sort of at the, at the margins um, of all of your papers. Um, so it strikes me that putting, you know, putting a lot of your different arguments together, what I'm hearing is that compelled speech cases have erred on both their valuation of the speaker side of the balance and their valuation of what we might call the listener side of the balance, because in a compelled speech situation, there's somebody receiving the information and the government interest is usually focused on them. So they've er erred both because uh, they have counted certain conduct, which shouldn't be counted as speech, as speech, as in the pricing um, dispute. Um, and because where it is speech, they've counted it too heavily, as perhaps in the disclosure of factual information or the payment of union dues. Um, and then on the other side, they have not counted seriously enough the various forms of harm to the listener if the speech is not compelled. Um, and so uh, what I'm wondering in part here is, do these critiques indicate that the, can they be accounted for within the current theory of free, freedom of speech? Or do they actually suggest that we need to modify our free speech theory in any way? Are there any of the criticisms here of the way things are being seen or counted that can be attributed to particular theoretical approaches or that would require different theoretical approaches to correct them. Um, and if they would, um, how would we then, in a sense, reflect back on the doctrine to account for that theoretical shift? In other words, I'm asking you to do a sort of reflective equilibrium thing here um, and think about how your doctrinal critiques reflect on theory 
and then how those theoretical alter alterations might in turn affect doctrine. So that's a huge question and just say whatever seems relevant. <laughs> I guess for me, I see uh, that what, what the court is doing with its in the free speech doctrine is what it's doing in virtually all, I don't want to say virtually all areas of Supreme Court jurisprudence, although perhaps that's true in, in lots of areas of Supreme Court jurisprudence, which is that it's, it's very ideologically driven and it's using what look like formalistic rules to uh, claim that there's this judicial modesty where there is no judicial modesty. It's overturning laws left and right up until uh, uh, the Civil War, there had been two cases, and during the Civil War, only three cases that had over, ever overturned uh, 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 congressional actions, right? And, and Marbury, Dred Scott, or the two before the Civil War. There was, it was almost not done. Uh, the, there's just a, an expansion of judicial authority that is striking economic regulations and is is more and more moving in the direction where it's allowing for, you know, what's going on with NIFLA, what I tried to mention, is an anti-abortion agenda as well that is driving decisions which the court won't say. And um, uh, and maybe, maybe that's too strong, but certainly one that curtails the right to an abortion and makes it more difficult for women to find out information. So my point is that if, if we have balancing, if we have a, a greater consideration of what the actual speech interests are, whether they are ideology or fact, for example, in Alan's term, although the whole complexity of trying to define what that means, uh, and, as well as the many other things, prudence and doctrine and history and structure, that this would uh, give much greater clarity. It would require judges, at least lower court judges, that have to abide by Supreme Court doctrine to actually expose what their thinking is and and ex expose the ideological drives behind some of their decisions. Um, I, I would just say that um, I, I don't want to take it because there's a bunch of other questions. Uh, your question is huge, obviously. Um, uh, but uh, I would say that uh, I actually use in the paper some of the sort of traditional theoretical arguments to say why, to explain why the difference between ideological statements and and facts are, are, are significant in terms of the the uh, under all the all the goals of the First Amendment, whether it's autonomy, uh, whether it's pro pro democracy. Marketplace arguments obviously favor should favor disclosure generally, um, as long as again it's truthful. So. Um, yeah, and just really quickly, I think, um, I, Susan, I think what you note is, is this kind of big question, right? And I think there's this sense that um, we have, so just to take like speaker versus listener autonomy, right? They become kind of points that you can raise all the time, right? And you, then it becomes how do you balance between those two things? Because listeners have an interest in getting as much factual information as they can, so they can kind of make their own decisions and just kind of affect their own self-realization. Um, and again, I think it kind of comes down to, I don't know if there's anything that, any kind of constraint that we can get from the, all this kind of theoretical morass, right? And I think what it, maybe we all have a stable sense of things about government, uh, what kinds of disclosures are sort of normal and, and okay, because we've all kind of disagreed to that. We just, we could just kind of have, a, again, a cultural consensus on that. Um, but what happens if there starts to be a push against, you know, there starts to be this kind of widening push against it. And uh, so I, I think that becomes, that's part of the reason why I think free speech doctrine is the, is the mess that it is right now, right? It's because we have, we're all kind of flying by the seat of our pants in different, in different situations, right? And we can't, and if, if that's the case, it's kind of, it becomes almost a more pragmatic kind of uh, common law-like thing where we're just kind of, going to have to talk to each other about it and see and see what we can do. Thank you. Uh, we are at the end of our official time, but I think we can run for an extra five minutes just to get in at least one of the uh, attendee questions. And Steve Sanders, are you going to sort of do that yes. part? Uh, yes, we actually have two. Let's try to uh, keep the responses brief and, and maybe we can squeeze in both questions. Um, one is from uh, Sarah Hahn and Alex, this is directed to you. Um, Professor uh, Tessis points out that the First Amendment reflects anti-authoritarian values. How should anti-authoritarian values inform compelled speech law when the authority is not government, but a massive corporation like ExxonMobil? 
Big co companies govern many aspects of Americans' lives. Shouldn't anti-authoritarian values support lower scrutiny for some kinds of information forcing laws? And then let me also just pose the second question so, so uh, David can prepare. This is from our colleague, Joe Tomain. Uh, his question is for David. Could you explain why the approach is more likely to happen um, than the other two approaches you thought were unlikely to happen anytime soon? For example, I don't think Alito would have written in Janus, we're overruling a mood because we don't like unions. Thank you. So if you can both briefly hit those, uh, we'll go about five minutes over and still give people about a 10 minute break before the new lecture. Uh, well, Sarah asks such a deep uh, question. Um, how do anti-authoritarian values inform the regulation of private entities? I, and I may add to her question, the social media companies comes into play. Let's just take out the issue of section 230, which immunizes social media companies from private suit. Um, I think it informs it greatly, but it informs it in an odd way, perhaps. And that is that when it comes to disclosure, the type of algorithms, for example, social media companies use, the purpose for which they're using the, uh, uh, our data, the, the dissemination of that data to other companies and to the specific companies that are, are to whom it, it has been provided for. I think that that gives, <clears throat> excuse me, greater authority to the government to regulate those sorts of concerns uh, where they enhance democracy, enhance our ability to participate, enhance our knowledge of who is it that is affecting our private feeds by these large mass conglomerate uh, uh, trillion dollar corporations. Uh, and there too, balancing has to play a role where it's speech and privacy issues are concerned, authoritarianism as opposed to self-expression and creativity and so on. Uh, so, you know, I would love it actually if the courts said, you know, we're going to rule this way because we don't like unions. Um, that, if that's what's actually driving them, then I think it would be great if they said that. Now, obviously, that's never going to happen. That's absolutely right. And so I think what I'm proposing is not that courts do that because I don't think that's ever going to be realistic. But really, it's kind of, I guess, openness about discussing values at a kind of maybe greater level of generality, right? So, um, you know, we have these kind of basic questions of, you know, why do we value speech and how does that sort of line up against government regulation, uh, various government prerogatives, and, you know, a, a much more transparent, like, how do we, as kind of Alex was talking about, how do we balance those two things, because essentially that's kind of what's being done. Um, and that doesn't mean that this doesn't come out, actually, and, and this, this, does, this comes out in courts analyses, you know, it comes out particularly if you're doing intermediate scrutiny style analyses. I think it tends to, th those, that tends to be the kind of the most transparent approach that we have now. So it's not like this is completely foreign. Um, so I think it's sort of, I'm asking for transparency sort of within that particular context. I think that radical transparency is probably never gonna happen, but at least if we have kind of transparency, maybe up one level from that of, of well, what are our kind of, you know, uh, our, our, commit, our sort of broad commitments here as far as how do we think about speech and how do we balance those things from situation to, from situation, to situation? Um, I, I, think that, I think that's particularly helpful. So I think um, you know, what, one way to, to think about this is like in, uh, so in, in like the Stevens case, right? So the Stevens case was the case where the court said, uh, no, no new low value categories of speech unless there's a, a sort of historical basis for it. And that's a kind of test I don't like because I think when you do a historical analysis, you can do it at varying levels of generality. You can draw all kinds of, you could have wide analogies, you can have narrow analogies, and you can basically hide the real, what's really a value judgment kind of inside your objective historical analysis. So, um, so again, I think um, radical transparency would be great, but I think sort of incrementally more transparency is a little more realistic, is hopefully more realistic. I think we're gonna try to squeeze in one last question. Um, uh, because the, the, uh, we have, uh, we're lucky enough to have uh, more than 90 attendees in the audience, and we, uh, we have one last question. So, the, Alex, this might be directed to you as a follow-up from the last question, but I guess if anybody has just very brief thoughts, even though I know it's a big topic, you could jump in. The question comes from Laura Carroll. Do we need to revisit the state action doctrine to include corporations if we truly want to see First Amendment protection in the modern world? Well, here I'm going to be completely anathema in, in saying uh, 
uh, that yeah, I think the, the 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 state action doctrine should have been thought to be the floor rather than the ceiling. That you know, uh, prohibit state action, but where there are licensed companies like the one you Sarah mentioned, Exxon, or as I mentioned, the, the social media companies, Facebook, Google, Amazon. Then uh, I, I do think that we it should be revisited. And I may say I know I'm going to sound like such a heretic from ordinary doctrine that I have to mention some names. It's not name dropping, but you know there's. If you look at Eric Foner's article of the Columbia uh, Law Review, uh, a different symposium that I ran years ago, he thinks that the state action doctrine should be shed. And then Mar uh, um, Martha um, uh, Nussbaum, uh, uh, I think it is, and I think it's in her writing. She also has an article in the Harvard Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review, where she too uh, speaks about dismantling the state action doctrine. So while it sounds very, out of the usual, and it's it, as David was saying, it's impo it's unthinkable that currently the court will overturn the state action doctrine. Nevertheless, it's it built on very questionable foundations with the disrupted desegregation in the United States in the 1880s. I mean, we could have desegregated in the 1880s through the Civil Rights Act of 1875, and the court stopped it all because, through the state action doctrine. So I, I can't see why it should be revisited. Yes. And if I can just throw in from a global perspective, there are many countries that in fact allow what they call horizontal application of rights between private individuals and do not require uh, a state action doctrine. So it's not, it's, it's plainly workable. Um, people do it. <laughs> okay, so at this point, oh, uh, 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 Caitlin, you may want to transition us. I'll just close out this part. and and. Let me remind the uh, attendees in the audience of the upcoming lecture, but also if you want to know the agenda for the afternoon, uh, it's law.indiana.edu slash compelled hyphen speech. Uh, so Caitlin, please. Thank you all so much for such a lively and engaging and, and thought provoking first panel of the day. Um, from here, we'll go ahead and take a quick break until noon when we'll come back for our keynote speaker, Robert Post. Uh, just a quick reminder to the panelists, if you could please turn off your cameras during this break, we would appreciate it. And we'll see you all back here at noon. Thank you very much. <laughs>